Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, I have a question for you this morning before we get started. Have you ever realized you were going the wrong way in the wrong direction? You ever been there? A couple of years ago, we do these mega vacations, kind of Griswold vacations. If you don't know what that is, think Chevy Chase, right? Family vacation. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we drove across America. We drove over to Los Angeles, and then we drove up to the Redwood Forest and then up into Oregon. But on our way, we decided to stop in that town called San Francisco. Everybody ever been there? And we were going to drive the curviest road, you know, in that little town. And so we were driving downtown, and we're, we're trying to figure out where this is. And I remember, uh, I, I'm not real good in the big city now. I've lived in Hawkins for a long time. And uh, so, you know, you get me out of Hawkins and I'm a little bit redneck. And so uh, I, I remember we were trying to find this curviest road and I turned down the road and realized very quickly I was on a one-way street going the wrong way. You ever been there? And, and I had a choice at that moment. I had a choice to either I could turn around or I could forge ahead and see if I could outrun them before I, they come to me or I could get to a turn, you know? And it's kind of a scary deal at that way. How many of you ever been to Ikea? Anybody ever been there? You ever been lost in Ikea? I remember the first time we went to Ikea, Danielle convinced me we were going to a baseball game and so we thought we'd go early and, and, and so we, we went into Ikea and once I got in there, I felt lost and I couldn't get out and they trapped you in that store. I mean, those people are wrong, man. And it's like, if I can just get out of here, I will never, ever, ever, ever come back to this place again. And I have not, amen? I will not go back to that place. But you know, you may not make a wrong turn going down a street or you may not get trapped in Ikea, but you may get lost in Hawkins, America. I don't know, that may be you or maybe in the ranch. Uh, maybe you've been lost in the woods or you ended up going somewhere you thought you were going, but you didn't get there and all that good stuff. And maybe some of you students, I remember when I went to high school and you had to learn your way around to high school and this whole new uh, era of getting lost in that and how big it was. Or, uh, you, you know, the, for many of us, we've never really thought about getting lost, but have you ever thought that you've been lost in life? That you reach a point in your journey where you just go, I, I don't know where I am. I don't even know how I got here. You see, what happens when you discover in life that you're lost, you have a choice at that moment. All of us have a choice at that moment. What are we gonna do when we realize we're lost and we're going in the wrong direction? And see, some of you this morning, if, I, if we're just really honest, some of you are at that point right now. Some of you are at that point right now where you are totally lost and, and, and you don't want anybody to know, but yet here's the funny thing, or maybe the sad thing is everybody looking in already knows that you're lost because of the decisions you're making, because of where we are. What happens when you discover that the way you've been going in life isn't the right way? And that's a big question. And some of you are asking that right now because you're stuck, you're lost. And, the, and probably the most healthy thing you can do is stop. But the problem is many of us don't. And for others of you, you've been lost before and, and now you've kind of found your way back and that's why you're here this morning and that's why you're doing what you're doing this morning. But for many of us, those big questions as believers that when we realize we're going the wrong direction, what do we do then? I believe that the answers that we find to that question is found in the scriptures. You see, as we said last week, it's the scriptures where we learn from people who God inspired to write down their stories. And all those stories that God had them write down and what we call the Bible, 
Bible, the scriptures today, we now can go back and we see their faith and we see their journey and we bring that forward and we realize even though we've never seen God, even though we've never touched God, maybe we've never heard God's voice audibly, we can have faith in God because we see the stories of people in the past and we take those stories and we learn that there are people that were lost, going the wrong way, and we realize what they did, and it allows us to learn from their true stories and their experiences from God. And so today, I want to take us to the book of Acts because there's, there's this great story in the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 9 if you want to turn there in your Bibles or your apps and get ahead uh, there. But just to give you a little background on, uh, on the book of Acts, the book of Acts was written by a doctor and a historian. His name was Luke. And Luke details some of the most important events that happened after Jesus died and rose again and, and Jesus ascended to heaven and he sent his followers on that mission. And so Luke begins to write write that down as they begin to spread the mission of Jesus and share Jesus with all the uh, area locally, first in Jerusalem, and then it began to spread in Judea and Samaria and eventually even as far as Damascus. And, and here's the deal, what we learned with Luke, is we find out that Jesus sent his disciples to spread the message, but there was also another group there that did not want the message to be spread. They did not want the good news of Jesus that he came to rescue the world from sin. They didn't want that message going out. And there was these people who saw the message of Jesus as bad news. And it threatened the way that they believed in God because they had a certain way that they believed and they had believed for thousands of years. And then Jesus has come onto the scene to fulfill the law. And now there's a group of people going, no, 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 no. That's gonna ruin our whole system. So many of them wanted to put a stop to the spread as quickly as possible. And probably nobody more than a guy named Saul. Now, you might recognize that name Saul. I'm not talking about the Old Testament Saul. I'm talking about the New Testament Saul. You may know him as Paul because he eventually becomes Paul, but he starts off in, as Saul in Acts, and this process goes on that uh, in Acts chapter 7, we get introduced to Saul, and there was this young man named Stephen who was questioned by the religious uh, leaders of that day about the way, and that's what they were called in that day. Oh, you're part of the way, and you're part of that, and you're part of that group, and so Stephen was called before the religious leaders and asked, do you believe this? And Stephen broke out on this incredible sermon. You need to go back and read it, man. It's really awesome, and, and what happens in that story is when Stephen finishes giving a defense for the gospel, I, I was reading this this last week and I was getting a visual of this, that it said literally the religious leaders, these are the guys like me, the religious leaders of that day literally put their hands on their ears and started screaming. And I got a visual of that and I just, I don't know, I thought that was kind of funny, you know, and it kind of reminded me of a three-year-old, you know, and where they're throwing a fit. You ever, you ever been around one of those? And, and so there's these grown men putting their hands on their ears and they're screaming and loud and they grab Stephen and they take Stephen outside the city and if that's not enough they take off their clothes yeah, oh <laughs> that's awesome and then they throw them at the feet of a guy named Saul and we're introduced to Saul if you know the rest of the story they ended up stoning Stephen and and, and basically murdering him and here's Saul standing off to the side in Acts chapter 7 watching it all in approval because nothing was more important to him than the thought of trying to stop the spread of the message of Jesus Christ. And he thought it was the right thing to do. He thought it was the right way to go. You see, there's something else you should know about Saul. Saul really wasn't a good man up to this point. He was a murderer, he was brutal. I'm amazed the Lord didn't just wipe him out like you would swat a fly, amen? I mean, the guy was brutal. He comes from a wealthy, influential family in Taurus. His father was a Pharisee. Saul was trained in to be a Pharisee as well. He was taught by one of the most famous Hebrew scholars of the day. He could speak Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. He memorized most of the Old Testament in his training. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the elite ruling authority in Jerusalem. He had good connections, access to the high priest, as we're going to see in just a moment. He was a Roman citizen, which meant he was a part of the upper class. I mean, this wasn't just a normal guy, right? He was raised in Taurus, which meant he, he had access to almost all the important universities of that area in the Greek culture 
culture and, and a combination of Greek culture, Hebrew religion, Roman law. And he didn't believe that Jesus was, was the Messiah. And so he actually thought he was doing the world a favor by wiping out the message of Jesus. He thought he was going the right way. He thought he was doing the right thing. And Saul made it his personal mission to try to silence the message of Jesus once and for all. And that's who we're dealing with here in Acts chapter 9. As we pick our story up, it picks up in verse 1. It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And so he went to the high priest. So here's Saul. He was in Jerusalem. He was making these threatening and intimidating and generally making life miserable for the followers of Jesus. And that, that literal Greek saying that he was breathing in threats of murder is the very atmosphere which he breathed. In other words, he lived in a climate of threatening. He lived in a climate of always being negative and trying to, to, to tear it down. That was what he was breathing in and breathing out. You ever been around people like that, what they're breathing in and what they're breathing out. They never have anything good to say. It's always negative. It's always bad. Always got to stop. See, we know people like Saul, don't we? He was breathing in an atmosphere of hate and violence and murder. Listen, the, what you think about most is what's going to come out eventually in action. And if you're always about murderous and hate and violence and murder, guess what? You can murder people with more than one way. You can murder people with your words. Don't miss that, church. Sometimes we go, oh, I'd never commit murder, but yet you'll speak death over people. Paul was speaking death. He was a one-man wrecking crew. But he wasn't settled on simply putting a stop to the message in, of Jesus in Jerusalem. No, 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 no. As the message began to spread, Paul said, we're going to take this show on the road. Look at verse 1 and 2 again. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest, and he had access to these guys, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. See, he was going to go and follow them in Damascus, but he needed letters to go to them because he wanted those religious leaders to know that he had the approval that he could round up. Look what it says so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So he got permission to take his persecution on the road. So he headed to Damascus. And when he found the followers of Jesus in Damascus, he was going to bring them all the way back to Jerusalem to put them on trial, kill them. He was going to make an example out of them. See, Saul thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was going the right direction. He actually thought he was helping people. He actually thought he was helping God. Isn't it amazing how the church through history has thought they were helping God and we were on the wrong side of that, amen? Boy, don't miss the connection here this morning. See, we've said this before, and I'm going to say it again, because I was telling Danielle this last week as I studied for this, and Thursday morning, as, uh, we, I was sitting at the house, and I, I was going through this. I realized, and I said this before, today you hear in the media, and you're hearing all these things that we're in, in unprecedented times in history with racism and social injustice and all the things going on. Hey, can I just be honest with you? It's not unprecedented for the church. If you'll notice right here in this passage, in the very early church, the racism between the Jews and the Greeks were just as powerful as between white and blacks today. And the old church was on the wrong side of that, Saul. You see, this has gone on for years and years and years, the chosen ones of God. We learn here that they're facing the same racial tensions in the New Testament that we're facing today. And here's the reality. What road are you on? Are you lost in this journey? Are you breathing hate all the time like Saul was? I told Danielle Sunday mor uh, the Thursday morning, as we look at this passage, we realize that we're teaching the same material that some of you guys have that box right now, some of you young guys out there, that box of that material, that you're, we're learning the same thing all together for you young guys all the way up to this old guys up here, and, and we're learning the same thing. And I told Danielle how amazing it is that last month when we put all this together and we started looking at this material, that we would be right here right now at this moment and this time, because God's word always speaks to the moment. Amen? Amen? If you're looking for it, you see the church, the Jewish leaders of the day thought they were on the right side of God, yet they headed in the wrong direction. Look at verse three, Saul headed out to Damascus and as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Well, that was a little unexpected, amen? Bad weather? Not quite, look at it, verse four. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? 
Okay, it's one thing to have a flash from the sky. It's a whole other thing to start hearing your name come out of the clouds. Amen? Uh, that'll get your attention, I'm telling you. Why are you against me? You see, the story of the conversion of Paul or Saul has been subject to great scrutiny. As I was studying this this last week, one early author suggested that Paul was suffering from epilepsy in this moment because they just couldn't wrap their head around the fact that God could actually speak from a cloud. When C.A. Spurgeon was asked about this epilepsy fit, that maybe Paul just had an epileptic fit on the moment and fell to the ground, and as we know, he became blind. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, that great English preacher, said this, Oh, blessed epilepsy, would that every man in London could have epilepsy like that. Amen? I told Danielle, maybe we all get epilepsy if that's what that means. You see, I don't think it was epilepsy. There's others who suggested that Paul was struck by lightning that an electrical storm broke out and Paul was struck, suddenly struck by lightning. See, one thing we know for sure, that Paul was utterly consistent throughout his whole life as to just what he heard and just what he saw. His story never changed. His story never changed that God struck him down. He says he saw the Lord Jesus. And this was only the first of many occasions where he saw the Lord and heard his voice and knew what it said and knew that it had a great effect on him. It wasn't some lightning stroke or, or, or epileptic seizure. It was the appearance of Jesus Christ to the man who was to be the mighty apostle to the Gentiles that, that took the message of, of Jesus outside of Jerusalem to the world so that you and I are here today. This is the man that God chose and set aside. Amen. Look at his response to the Lord's question in verse 5. Who are you, Lord? There was a moment where he recognized, it's amazing to me. Saul asked, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Can you imagine this conversation? Can you imagine this? I mean, all this time Saul thought that this Jesus was against, that he was against was a fake. That this whole Jesus thing was fake news, amen? I thought I'd connect that a little bit today, amen? Well, some of you can't laugh at that, you know. So. Um, and then all of a sudden, here's Jesus himself, the fake news. Sorry, I'll leave that alone. Um, coming to Saul, the guy who didn't believe, and all of a sudden he's like, oh, there's Jesus. And Jesus wasn't done. So why are you against me? And then in verse 6, he says, now get up and go into the city. And you'll be told what you must do. Now, in case you think Paul was suffering from heat stroke or hearing, voice verses, or hearing voices, check out this next verse. Because in chapter 9, verse 7, it says, The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. You think? You think? And they heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Mm, a moment there. So Saul gets up, but there was a problem. There's a big problem. Look at verse 8 and 9. So Saul got up from the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. Everybody say nothing. nothing. Couldn't see anything. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So after seeing Jesus for who he really was, after coming face to face with the Savior, now Saul couldn't see. Like physically, the dude was blind. For three days, isn't that ironic? He was blind. And where were they? Damascus, the original place he was heading. And here's what's unique, and I'll tell you this is interesting, because what he came to Damascus to do and what he would do now in Damascus couldn't be any further apart from each other. Because he came to Damascus to destroy the message of Jesus, and on his way, he's confronted with Jesus, and you're going to have to wait till next week for the rest of the story, so come back, all right? But I'm telling you, it's good stuff, so go back to the road. So when he left Jerusalem, right, he was convinced he was headed the right way. You ever been convinced you're headed the right way? And he was convinced the right way was being against Jesus. As he neared Damascus, he was forced face to face with an important reality. What he believed was the right way had been the wrong way all along. And some of you are right there. What you thought was going to bring you satisfaction, what you thought was going to bring you meaning, what you thought was going to fulfill you is no longer fulfilling you. It's destroying you. And you didn't want to breathe in that atmosphere of hate and destruction, but that's where you find yourself today. See, it's not the first time followers of Jesus have been confronted with this reality. 
his opposition of Jesus and his followers was not God's work. It was against God's work. You see, Jesus met Saul on the road to Damascus. And for Saul, that means that Jesus must be alive. It must be real. And if Jesus is alive, then everything Saul believed about Jesus was wrong. You see, that day on that road, Saul saw Jesus from a new perspective. And it changed everything. You see, I want to put this statement up on the screen. The bottom line of everything of this message today is knowing Jesus changes the way you see everything. That when you know Jesus, it changes the way you see everything. It changes the way you see skin color. It changes the way you see sexuality. It it changes the way you see intimacy. It changes the way you see money. It changes the way you see words. It changes everything when you have an encounter with Jesus. Everything changes. You see, at the beginning of the story, I told you about turning the wrong way on a one-way street in San Francisco. And in that moment, it would have been one thing to turn into that street and realize I'd made a terrible mistake. But go, oh, well, I'm just going to keep on driving. The rest of my vehicle would have gone crazy, amen? I mean, they were going crazy enough as it was. Edward, it's a one-way street. Edward, it's a one-way street. Edward. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do. You ever been there? Yeah. But if I just kept going, I'd do nothing to fix the problem, would it? And can I just tell you, for some of you in this room this morning, and maybe you're listening this morning online, and we're so glad you are. But listen to me. If you don't do anything about where you're heading right now, guess what? It's not going to end well. Some of you have bought the lie. And you're dabbling in things thinking that's going to satisfy and that's going to satisfy and that's going to satisfy. And yet you spend more and you spend more time and you spend more effort and you know you're lost. You know you're going the wrong way. But listen, if you don't do something about it, it's not going to end well. See, when you realize you're headed the wrong way and you see the way things are supposed to be and you need to do everything you can to head in the right direction, amen, to turn that ship around, so to speak. You see, chances are, you're probably not going to have that flash of light, voice of Jesus on the road experience like Saul did. And I know some of you are thinking, well, if Jesus would just do that, then I would change. Really? Do you want to come face to face with the God of the universe? Come on. But you know what? There's a lot of times when God might try to nudge us. Hey, listen, bud, I love you. You're going the wrong way. I love you, sis. But you need to wake up. And so many times that soft, still voice, maybe we say an unkind word to someone and a good friend corrects us before we go too far. And we need to heed that. And we ask for forgiveness. Sometimes God speaks to us through godly people. Or maybe we're anxious and worried and we find ourselves start going down a path of fear. And I think that's what I've noticed over the last few weeks of the church is that we've gotten anxious And we find ourselves down that path of fear. And while everything that we've experienced over the last few weeks is real, for many of us, we've chosen a path of fear, thinking that's the right way, when we realize what Scripture says is God has our days numbered. He knows our days. Now, we don't want to test the Lord, amen? Amen. Okay? But listen to me. We don't live in fear. We don't live in fear. He has us. He knows our day. In fact, he knew the day I'd be born, and he knows the day I'm going to die. And guess what? I'm invincible until that day. Come on. You believe that, church? So how about you? How does God get your attention? Have you seen God get your attention in the past? Maybe it's through a friend or a small group. We were listening to worship the other night on the back porch, and Darlene Sheck made a comment about worship gives us handles to grab a hold of God sometimes. You see, what you put into your head changes what you think about what's around you. Amen? And some of you are breathing in all these things of the world, and it's no wonder you're scared. It's no wonder you're afraid. It's no wonder you're still locked down because you're breathing in all the things of the culture and not breathing in the things of God. And all along, I think God is just wanting you to go, psst, I love you. I've got this. Do you trust me? I know you think you're going the right way. I know you think you're doing the right thing. Psst, I love you. I've got this. I've got this. 
See, there's many ways that God can get our attention, but like Saul, we've got to be willing to respond when he does. You see, I tell students this, and I told our student ministry this when I was doing student ministry a couple of years ago. You will either become the illustration of not listening to God, or you'll become the glory of God by following him. Adults, listen to me. Young adults, listen to me. You'll either become the illustration that people will go, don't do it like him. Don't do it like her. Or you will become the illustration where everybody says, that's the glory of God. Follow what he did. Follow what she did. And you have a choice. You see, here's a preview of what happens next week, but you got to come back, but I'm going to give you just a little preview. You ready? In Acts chapter 9, verses 17 and 19, placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may again, may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell off Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained regained his strength. You see, Paul was seeing things differently. Why? Because knowing Jesus changes the way you see everything. Put it up on the screen again, guys. Knowing Jesus changes the way you see everything. I heard this statement, and I, I tweeted it out this last week. Some of you follow me on Twitter. It says this, nature forms us, sin deforms us, Education informs us, prison reforms us, but only Jesus transforms us. Isn't that good? Listen, I don't think we need more education. And I don't think we need more prison time. I mean, I think some guys need prison time. Don't get me wrong, all right? I'm okay with that. But what we need more than anything is Jesus. Transformation. Changing the way we think. Scales fell off his eyes. I think both literally and symbolically. See, all those long built-up prejudices of the Pharisees against the Gentiles, all the bigotry, the pride, and the prejudice that twisted and distorted his view of the dogs and the Gentile world, all of that disappeared in a moment. Let me tell you how you know you've had an encounter with Jesus. You start seeing things and people differently. I'm going to let that rest for a minute. This is how you know you've had an encounter with Jesus. You start seeing people, and you start seeing things differently. You quit posting those things on Facebook. Some of the stuff I see posted on Facebook about racism makes me cringe. And these are people that go to church. I'll tell you something. You have an encounter with Jesus, you'll start seeing that differently. You'll start seeing the culture differently. That's what happens. You see, Saul, Saul... Saul, 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 say that 10 times, right? Paul, Saul, we'll say that, the whole world, Jews and Gentiles alike, as men and women bearing the image of God and needed to be restored. Not black or white, not Jew or Gentile, not rich or poor. He saw men and women as image bearers of God that needed to be restored and redeemed. He no longer saw divisions. He learned to judge no man according to the flesh, but to see him only in a potential subject for the kingdom of God. Listen, knowing Jesus changes the way you see everything. Racism, division, social unrest, social injustice can only be changed through Jesus, a relationship with him. We don't need more words. We need action of loving people. Amen? No words are going to fix us, all three of us. Amen? All three of us. Words are not going to fix us. Action of loving people are. Because when you have an encounter with Jesus, it changes you. Let me close with Paul's words. This is that same guy who was writing the the Corinth church, and he wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, for Christ's love compels us, not my raising, not my past, not my riches, not my education, not my daddy, not my mama, not my school, not anything else. Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. So now, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation is has come, the old is gone, the new is here, and all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and why should we? And he has committed to us the message 
of reconciliation. Listen, church, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me online. If you're listening this week, knowing Jesus changes the way you see everything and everyone. Knowing Jesus changes the way you see everything and everyone. And so, so here's, here's, it changed Paul. It changed Paul. What's it going to take for God to get your attention? Are you going to continue to live in that atmosphere of racism, of social injustice, and all those things, and the world of Fox News, and the world of CNN, and the world of 97.5? You want me to go on? <laughs> See, I get caught up in that. I'm just honest. Sometimes I'll go home and I'll hit 97.5. You don't know what that is? That's conservative talk radio. And I'll find myself between here, Gary, and my house, which is eight miles down the road. And by the time I get to the house, I'm ticked off at the world. Anybody else get there? And I have to sit in my driveway sometimes and go, okay, that's not who I am. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And he changed me. And I don't want to breathe hate. Daniel told me the other day, you're starting to talk to the TV again. That was convicting for me. Or Twitter. I'll talk to Twitter, too, because that's another issue. Um, thanks, babe, for confessing my sin. Um, I know. I mean, it, it happens, doesn't it? So what's it going to take for God to get your attention? And will you listen? Are you willing to take some steps towards freedom? To turn around. See, I had a choice on that road in San Francisco. I could have continued to go down that road or I could have turned around. And when I turned around, I stopped traffic. Because sometimes to turn around means you got to stop and turn around and head the other direction. That's called repentance. So what are you going to do with that? Because see, knowing Jesus changes the way you see everything and everyone. Let's pray together. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you do change everything. You didn't just come to change our eternity, which we're so grateful that our eternal salvation is secured in Jesus. But God, you also came to set us free from the power of sin. One of these days we'll be free from the presence, but today we can be free from the power of sin. So Father, I pray for that one that's in this room. And God, very honestly, they grew up in a racist lifestyle. They grew up in a racist culture. And God, it's very hard for them to let that go. God, would you come in and give them freedom? God, I pray for that young man or young woman that's stuck in sexuality. That they're doing things that if people found out, it would embarrass them. And the enemy's just waiting for the right moment. And yet they're confronted this morning to know they need to change. They need help. Give them courage. God, convict them. Lead them to repentance. Set them free from the power of sin. If they're in you, they're already free. God, just help them walk in that. And God, if there's somebody here this morning or maybe you're listening online and, and God, they don't know you. They've never had a moment where they've surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, where they realize their sin separated them. And God, would you give them courage this morning to call on your name, to believe on your name, confess your name out loud. And God, your word says they'll be saved. Lord, if the world needs anything right now, it needs Jesus. Doesn't need more law. It doesn't need more words. It needs Jesus. So God, I pray today as we leave this place, as we sing this last song, that we would walk out of this building and Father, we'd be little Jesuses walking out into our world, into our workplace, into our circles of friends, that people would see us loving people the way Jesus loved people. And they'd be hungry for that and hungry for freedom. So, Lord, I love you. Bless this last song as we sing it together, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to 
uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you. I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.